my books. There's a shelf there with all my books. Gotcha. Hey, just so you know, for uh, how can I say for pri pri privacy, uh, I've already I've just started the recording. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So whatever you say now, it may be used against you. <laughs> <I'm worried. laughs> There you go. See, that's that's your British coffee. Well, British. Sorry, sorry about that. That's your European coffee. With your espresso. Yes, that's it. So, uh, first of all, let me start by saying thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to pick your brain. And uh, unfortunately, first things first, I need to bite the bullet and say that there are so many specific questions I would like to ask you. But the truth of the matter is, my idea is to make Italian people aware of your persona, of your expertise. So I am afraid that this is going to be that boring for you. Right. Because <laughs> it's going to be obviously uh, as brief as you like uh, introduction of yourself. What did you study? How you got involved in bodybuilding? Um, so first thing first, who's Dr. D now? What do you do? And then we can uh, jump uh, back in the time and uh, start uh, from the scratch. So I guess Dr. Dean said, Mark, what I do, my actual career job is that I'm a plasma dry etch chemical engineer for Intel. In so that, that is that is my, my daytime career job. I'm a chemical engineer. And then obviously people within the UK probably know me through being the formulator of a supplement brand called Supplement Needs. Obviously, the Supplement Needs brand has a dedicated line of my own special health supplements, which were all formulated based off research surrounding how best to support bodybuilders' health from a functional medicine perspective. So how it all began, my background. Hey, that... Before we go with that, uh, you spoke about functional medicine. Um, could you go a little further on this, please? Because yeah, it sounds so... different just by definition of than regular allopathic medicine. Yeah, so allopathic or conventional medicine tends to more focus on treatment of symptoms. So you go to your doctor, you have, say, high blood pressure. You get prescribed a medication to control blood pressure. <clears throat> Functional medicine focuses on what's actually the root cause of a disease, what actually drives the pathogenicity or what drives the actual dysfunction within the body, the disease. This man, there you go. <laughs> so with, with functional medicine, you start to think of what is driving the disease as opposed to how can we control the disease. Um, so for blood pressure, you start to then take a more global approach to the body. So rather than viewing blood pressure, for example, within conventional medicine, where you'd say, give a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, which would help to dilate the blood vessels. Functional medicine starts to look at, is there a genetic controlling factor? Is the person's lifestyle or diet driving the disease? Of course, there is prescription of, I guess, pharmaceutical compounds if it's necessary, but it's all about driving back to what is the root cause that has caused this disease in the body and treating that head on. And um, I think at some point, either physicians have gotten lazy and it's basically, how can I get this patient out of my office as quick as possible with a prescription? Or, you know, it's, it's driven by pharmaceutical companies who and more so in the business of keeping customers coming back to you with the use of, of pharmaceutical pro products. Or it, again, it's just that there's no more further interest to actually cure people's problems. Okay. So are you saying that you may be somebody with a degree, a PhD, and still have your doubts regarding the big pharma? Without yeah. wearing a tinfoil hat and <laughs> flapping about aliens and such. I mean, so, you can actually be a rational person and having doubts about something. Exactly. So, I mean, my, my, background, yeah. my background is in chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. So, I, I finished top of one of the top Irish universities 
in, in my class with with a, a first class honors degree in chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. So pharmaceutical chemistry basically was like pharmacology or pharmacy, except we are looking at how you can design drugs. So from a chemistry perspective, how do we manipulate molecules to come up with compounds for pharmaceutical usage? Throughout that, I was working as a pharmacy dispenser. So I got qualified. My part time job during college was as a pharmacy assistant. So I helped fill prescriptions with a pharmacist. And just every single week, I started to think in my head that there was people coming in for certain medications that had they maybe been probed further into their lifestyle or certain, you know, man managing aspects of their environment that they may not need that medication or their medication might be need might be reduced. So obviously, when I finished my degree, I, I did have a choice. Obviously, I could go and just get a job in a pharmaceutical company. But the PhD was more appealing to me at that point to go into looking at more further into organic chemistry and synthesis. And it, it was just more, more appealing to go down that route. But even more so when I finished my PhD, at that point, I'd been bodybuilding for three years. And my opinion of the pharmaceutical industry completely changed. And it was no longer something that I wanted to pursue if I was going to go into industry following my PhD. And that was more so where um, I went down the route of entering chemical engineering because I wanted to get away as far from the pharmaceutical industry. During my undergraduate, I did work for Pfizer and I got to see firsthand, you know, how a pharmaceutical company works. Um, not that anything bad happened at all, but just looking at how globally pharmaceutical companies can approach global health, it's not really in people's best positive interest, in my opinion. And when you start to question things like that, you do get called the tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, yes. unfortunately. I can imagine. So regardless of how good you are, of course. Um, well, it goes to show that for somebody like you with your background, you have enough knowledge to counteract those uh, arguments in a very scientific way. But for somebody who doesn't have it, but maybe has an instinct that something is not quite right, it's much more difficult to get rid of the, uh, the way be called. Yeah, and I mean, I I've had this argument before with people that 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 in itself is an error bias where it's basically education by authority. So it's that because someone doesn't have a degree or doesn't have a doctorate in a certain area that they cannot speak on a topic because they're not technically qualified, which, to be honest, is a very poor way of arguing with someone because everyone's opinion should be validated. And um, if if someone wasn't an expert in their field, you should still be able to listen to their opinion and be able to offer a counter argument. And I mean, that this is where when someone starts to debate, say, online a certain topic, you need to know both sides of the argument before you enter into a discussion with someone. Because all then that's happening is that you have a biased argument where one person's opinion is just going against another person's opinion without either of the two people understanding the other person's point of view. And I Fair think enough. that's that's more more effective way of arguing that you you understand someone's opinion is valid, but you should be able to then prove your point over over theirs whilst having some sort of I can't really say compassion, but understanding of why they feel the way they feel towards a certain topic. Uh, fantastic idea, by the way. I would, uh, so I, I would agree with that 100%. Um, so how did you get started bodybuilding? It was your first love. You used to do something else before, and then you fell into bodybuilding. How did it start? So I started bodybuilding when I was properly when I was 21. 
that was because prior to that, I was a world champion kickboxer. So don't mess around the guys. <laughs> but an accident at one point during training caused me to smash my right ankle and I'd have a, a surgery to help clean up some of the debris of the smashed bone. And the consultant basically told me, oh, you're never going to kickbox again. So as stubborn as I am, I wanted to prove him wrong. And I went through it a lot of rehab, a lot of physio, that was 2009, then 2010, I went back kickboxing training and then won the WKC World Championships, but at that point, I sort of had to think of longevity, which is my sort of ethos surrounding even bodybuilding, that if I continue kickboxing, what's the health of my ankle going to be like in, say, five or ten years' time? Poor, I suppose. You know, from <laughs> repeatedly kicking, regardless of doing rehab, strengthening, I'm at, at a big disadvantage because there is a, a small chunk at the bottom of my tibia missing. Um, so when I took a step back, I'd been training in the gym as part of kickboxing for strength training, and obviously I was training with my father. Um, my dad... He had a big interest in bodybuilding. And he said to me, why, why not try bodybuilding as, as a hobby, as a sport, something to, you know, keep you ent entertained, basically. And I, I'd always followed sort of bodybuilding growing up in, in my late teens and, you know, looking at magazines. So I just started training in the gym properly, like started to develop, you know, a routine, a proper weight, progressive overload routine, as opposed to actually just using, you know, bench press, overhead press, squats for kickboxing, for core strength and made the decision then when I was 23 why not compete in a show so, and that, since then that's, that's sort of where everything has taken off Fantastic uh, You said your father pushed you in some way um, to try bodybuilding well, obviously you probably are not aware how bodybuilding works in Italy but I can tell you the probably 99.9% .9 of Italian bodybuilders now are going, are going to be like, oh, fuck, man, I wish my father told me something like that. <laughs> Chances are people who are going to watch this will be in the way, in the opposite way. Something like they have to do, maybe because uh, the doctor told them to build a little bit of strength, but that was it. Definitely no encouragement, no um, uh, whatsoever form of support towards bodybuilding. And to be honest, even here in the UK, where the situation towards bodybuilding is much, much different, you still see plenty of, um, no hate, but not very much love around this, uh, this sport. Why, why would you think so? Why would you think uh, there are so many um, opinion bias against this, this discipline or sport or whatever you want to call it? That's a very, very complex sort of social question, because I guess on, on one aspect, you have people who, I'm not going to say I have, a, I have a jealous opinion, but I guess there's sort of this viewpoint that we sort of see in, in this Western society of, oh, that guy thinks he's better than me, purely because of, you know, having a better looking physique. You know, you, you sort of hear all these comments if you go on holiday and you are in decent shape. You know, there's sort of snide comments of people in the background, you know, oh, bodybuilder, steroid user. There's this sort of, I guess, I guess underlying unhappiness maybe in certain people that don't want to see others have a progressively better physique than themselves. Um, I guess as well from that, like, a further point is also you know, the, the stigma surrounding anabolic steroids and bodybuilding um, and how, I guess, the media to a certain extent has warped an opinion towards people's mindset of the usage of steroids within bodybuilding. Um, I, I honestly, I think in, in the last five to six years, as a sport, bodybuilding has grown compared to when I first started. There was a very, I guess, 
niche sport 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, I'm know, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, how old are you now, Dr. Dean? So people have a sure. timeline and you start. 32. 32. 32. So 10 years ago. So 10 years ago. Um, when I started to you know, even follow the Irish bodybuilding scene, it was a very niche sport in that you only had, you know, the guys that were competing at the national level when I was 20, 21 were viewed as like these monsters. And then obviously with the incorporation in the last five years of other divisions like men's physique, classical bodybuilding, you know, all the women divisions, bikini, wellness, it sort of made the sport more popular in terms of making it more accessible for people to enter as a sport. So I think that the opinion over the last five to six years has sort of changed that, I guess as well with social media, people don't have as much of a stigmatized view towards bodybuilding as they had previously. Do you think this is because by increasing the classes and the federation and such, bodybuilding in some way leveled themselves down to the general public? Or, it, it, for the, sorry, or maybe because people believe that if they see an easier physique, an easier look, that's going to be reachable with less chemicals. Yeah, I do. I, I see both aspects. And I mean, it, it has led to a small decline in bodybuilding overall versus more so fitness modeling is what I'd sort of put towards what these new phys physique categories are doing. Um, like even for example, last year's um, Irish national competitions, there was maybe five or six bodybuilders in each class category. Whereas when I first started competing 10 years ago, you had maybe 18 to 20 people in a class. So placing top six within the national categories a few years ago my mind was a big achievement whereas now it's re it's gotten very diluted down because people start to see that these other physique classes are more accessible you don't have to diet as hard there's no potential um heavy compound usage and it more so fits in with mainstream media the look that's being displayed gotcha yeah, you did the Irish, didn't you? Yeah, the, yes. Uh, the one that you won. So I've I've never managed to win an Irish national title yet. Okay. I've done, I've done Mr. Ireland in terms of NABA and IFBB, okay. but the highest I've ever placed is third. Third. Um, Out of how many competitors? Talking about the... Like back then, at least 20. It was yeah, a big class. show. 20 competitors? Yeah. Like all the way up until my last show, which was 2017, every class I've ever entered has had about 20 people. And I've always managed to place somewhere in the top six. And by the way, guys, he looked peeled <laughs> and big as fuck. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attach some pictures so you can see what we're talking about. It's not like, just what some people <laughs> call him armchair pharmacologist, which is just beyond ridiculous. Anyway. And like, I mean... With um, so with that, that's still sort of a goal of mine is to go back to the Irish national stage and and finally win it before retiring. I've no, I've no uh, ambitions of being a professional bodybuilder or being a an international bodybuilder. I did go to the IFBB European Championships for Ireland in two thousand and thirteen, and that was a big eye opener. Because I was coming from a student who was just competing in bodybuilding for a hobby, for fun, going against guys in the European Championships who are actually being paid by their countries to go and compete in bodybuilding. Yeah, of course. I can imagine. You know, you have Egypt, not Egypt weren't at the European Championships, obviously, but Egypt have a world class bodybuilding team who get paid every year to compete. But the likes of Belarus, um, Turkey, um, Croatia, they had very strong bodybuilding teams. And I mean, at that time, obviously I'd seen Irish bodybuilders and, you know, idols within Irish bodybuilding. 
when we were weighing in for the European Championship, you have to weigh in in your posing trunks. And I remember just standing in line looking at some of the guys who eventually ended up winning my class and just being in pure utter disbelief at like the, the quality of these guys' physiques. Obviously, they were, you know, much... I was only 24 at the time. These guys were like in their late 20s, early 30s. Obviously, yeah. I, had, I had a lot more time on me, but it gave me appreciation of, you know, you the may be... Work. Yeah, you know, you may be certain level within your country, but then you start to look on a global level and your your ambitions need to have a really high drive in order to take you to that level, basically. Um, and it's just never been... As much as I love bodybuilding, I don't think um, pursuing that as a, as a career, as to speak, is something that I've ever viewed yeah. as. Also because if you were accused of a waste of brain by pursuing the music... <laughs> Probably, <laughs> if I remember correctly, from your age, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, like you're on about, um, obviously, with Italian fathers and whatever. Originally, my whole ambition as a teenager was to be a medical doctor. Okay. To, to pursue medicine. But again, at, at some point, around the age of 16, I, I just had a change of, of opinion of, I started to really think of the, the life that you dedicate to medicine and, you know, family life being impacted and start to really think that, OK, all this time I've really wanted to be a medical doctor. And, you know, my grades were there. My interest in science was there to the point then when I didn't want to be a medical doctor anymore. I, I, uh, music was a huge interest along with sport. I said to my parents, I want to be a musician. And my mom just said, uh, no chance in hell. <laughs> so they had to convince me that go and do a degree, something outside music, so you have a backup plan. When you finish that degree, do whatever you want. And it was, I think a, it was, was a good advice. I think she was sort of hoping then at some point music would sort of die off and I'd forget about it. But I, I, I think when it came to the end of my degree, because... My passion was chemistry. That's sort of what drove me into my degree then outside of music. When I came to the end of the degree, um, not, not that my passion for pursuing music had dropped off, but I, I wanted to pursue the PhD more so as a, a curious ambition. Um, even though I, I like with, with music, I played in a very good band in Dublin within mm -hmm. Ireland, and we were playing our own music nearly three or four times a week in all the different popular venues of Dublin. Um, and we were all very academically capable. Like the drummer went on to do a PhD in psychology. The, nice. guitar, the guitarist, he went on and done a master's in literature, I think. So we were, were very academically based as well. But um, I think because of when I went into the PhD and then the drummer went and done his PhD in psychology, as a group, we started to like slowly grow apart based on our time commitments. And that was sort of when the playing with the band sort of fell out. And that was when the academic side of the PhD took over then. And then obviously within the PhD was when I started actually bodybuilding because at that point I stopped kickboxing at 21. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, well, you know, I often, I often think about that like with music what sort of direction your life would take if you went down different paths? Guilt. <laughs> so, I suppose. I mean, I mean, you know, as fun as music was, it, it is a very volatile career. You know, yeah. you can be very popular one minute and then have nothing the next. Um, and I guess that sort of uncertainty as well was what weighed on my mind because there was points with that band where I was all in for it being a profession of like, guys, that's it. Let's go get a record deal. Cause this was when the time when music was actually a proper profession before all online digital music. It was sort of, you know, you got your record deal, you played your music, you got paid to play your music, which isn't sort of the case nowadays with everyone having so much access to online music. It's a very different industry now. Um, and so, I guess you start to then think, what was it the best decision or not? 
but I mean the, the guitars are always going to be there so still yeah a, I suppose it's still it's still a passion to to sit down and play sometimes when I get time but obviously my my skill level to back then when I was young and really ambitious is a lot less today. <laughs> I understand that. Well, from a bodybuilding perspective, I guess uh, there was uh, your choice was the best for all of us. But that's what my wife says to me. My wife, when I said to my wife uh, jokingly the other day about music, she said, "Well, if you had went down that route, you wouldn't have." Supplement needs the world wouldn't know, you know, Dr. Dean, they wouldn't know, you, you know, the, the help that you've put out there in terms of bodybuilders' health, it would be completely different. True. But, you know, I guess that's that's sort of the mirroring reality of what happens when you make decisions in life. And a segue of this, uh, it would be this you are absolutely um, idolized in the industry, mostly for, well, many, many things, but there are. Three things that really stick out, which are your stance on the actual uh, post cycle therapy, your beef against the blast and cruise uh, by whole definition, and your own uh, more uh, scientific driven definition, and your work with supplement need. So I would love a brief reason why and what were the original mistakes with which one of this. And what was your uh, contribution? So people can appreciate what have been done for the industry. Yeah, so I guess my, my whole outcry started with seeing silly mistakes on forums. And I'm reading, like obviously when I was starting bodybuilding, I'd be on all these online forums reading other people's opinions were. And PCT was one thing that with my background in pharmaceutical chemistry and obviously my understanding of hormones and endocrinology just never made sense to me. Um, the guy who sort of, you know, well-renowned ar around the world for PCT would be Dr. Michael Scali, and he has a, a, a protocol known as the Power PCT. The Power PCT is brilliant in terms of the actual thought process of the pharmaceutical compounds that are used in the PCT to restore a person's natural testosterone production is correct. What was starting to annoy me was when you start to actually logically think of why you use these compounds on every single forum, and Dr. Scali never ever said this anywhere, and he recently wrote an article last year basically outlining this, it was basically told that two weeks after you stop injecting yourself, start your PCT. Now, from a pharmacology background, that doesn't make sense because some compounds, due to the esters that the compounds are attached to, they stay in your body for way longer than two weeks before they fully clear out. Uh, just, just for some viewers who may not know, uh, the ester is basically the releasing mechanism of the hormone you, in, uh, you inject. Exactly, yeah. And Perfect. certain ones, you know, will have a, a two-day half-life, meaning in two days, half the concentration is cleared. Some of them have a week half-life. And then others have up to two weeks. So when you start to break that down on a, a pharmacological level, some of these compounds can stay in your system for at least five or six weeks before they've left, before your body fully metabolizes all that compound. Now, on a simple level, the HPTA, which is what makes testosterone in your body, gets shut off when you take anabolic steroids or testosterone supplementation because of the feedback mechanism. So when you have a high level of testosterone, it basically tells your body, you don't need to make testosterone. We have enough already. <clears throat> but in order to return the HPTA back to normal, there needs to be no exogenous hormone present you need to make sure that you know this feedback mechanism is not there anymore and that was where i started to say two weeks isn't long enough to be waiting because you still have some compound in your system if you get blood work done at the two week mark post use i guarantee you that your lh and fsh the two fertility hormones are going to be zero and you're still going to have a high enough level of testosterone in your body, meaning that 
your system is still shut down. A more sound approach, for example, would be if a compound has a half-life of one week, well, let's wait four or five weeks to make sure that that compound is fully gone from your body. At that point, get your blood work done and see where your HBTA is now with the compound cleared. Some lucky individuals, when they play this part of patients, end up actually recovering back to a natural level of testosterone because their body senses that the hormone is cleared and the HBTA starts making the fertility hormones again to make testosterone. Have you seen this happening to your uh, clients, right? Yeah, yes, I have, yeah. I've seen so we are not just talking about a uh, mere theory. This is yeah, a factual this thing. This is a factual thing. And uh, in a lot of cases, people actually question, I thought I need to do a PCT. And it's like, no. A PCT is a pharmacological approach or a pharmaceutical approach to when the HPTA does not respond. So then we use pharmaceutical compounds to elicit the restarting of the HPTA. Um, and that's when we start to have to use pharmaceutical compounds like HCG, clomiphene, tamoxifen. They're only incorporated when the HPTA doesn't respond. Okay. In most cases, first time users or second time users get lucky if they play this part of patients, the HPTA senses that there's no testosterone present and starts going, okay, the hypothalamus then starts to kick start this cycle again. And again, like I said, so many people have been shocked based off this blood work at five weeks when they've consulted with me and my answer to them is basically, you don't need a PCT. And it's like, why? It's like, well, your natural HPTA is running again. You're making natural testosterone. And there's sort of a shock disbelief that, I guess, from all the bro science and forms that people are sort of fed into believing that I take steroids, therefore I need to do PCT. And it's, and it's not necessarily as black and white as that. It's that you've taken steroids. We then assess how your HPTA is and whether we need to, I guess, add in compounds to rectify this, this scenario. So uh, two considerations. First, the main difference, well, if, you, if we take the Dr. Scully PCT, which is, is the, the, the cornerstone in terms of um, pharmacology of what we have, your main issue with that, it wasn't with uh, Dr. Scully by himself, rather be with the timing that the bro tends to use with um, his PCT, his um, yeah. power protocol. Exactly. And, the, and the other is the psychological issue that some people may have with the fact that PCT is not a be all end all, but it's just a medium to reach something, which is healthy testosterone levels. Exactly, yeah. Even that though was... this means losing <clears throat> some or all your gains, because this is something that people get frustrated with. And this is something that gives us to the second point, which is the TRT cruise or known blast and cruise problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so like with, with, with PCT, you end up with this, again, like you said, a psychological aspect. And people fall into this trap, I guess, of bro science that I use steroids, I need the PCT. I take a break and then I use steroids again. And what that sort of ends up driving, in my opinion, is a, a, a psychological disturbance in that you make progress, you regress, you, you have this, you know, regression period where um, someone comes off steroids to restore their natural HPTA, sees that their physique has now changed unfavorably. So they're going to have, you know, low levels of testosterone, potentially higher levels of estrogen after they finish taking steroids during their PCT, see that their physique is horrible at the end of the PCT and then think, oh, if I take steroids again, I'm going to, you know, rectify the solution and get back to where I was before. And you end up in this psychological dependence where the person just is going around in circles. And again, can further drive a psychological need further on from that, that the person never really ever ceases steroid use. <clears throat> The blasting cruising aspect, again, was something that it made me very popular when I started to speak on about because it was coming from that psychological dependency issue and also from a health aspect. 
So a PCT is not the healthiest thing that your body can go through, regardless of what someone wants to say. It's it's going to disturb your hormone level in order to restore you back to that natural testosterone level. There's huge potential post testosterone use or anabolic steroid use to induce metabolic syndrome. So you can be causing a high likelihood of type 2 diabetes or um, cardiovascular disease being driven by low hormones. And I guess <clears throat> you also have the more so vitality aspect that you were at an, a higher level of testosterone and you've come back to a lower level of testosterone so that energy drive is, is diminished. With Blask and Cruz, and it was sort of, you know, this opinion, even amongst amateurs, which is a silly idea that you blast at a high level of steroids, a high dosage, and then you cruise for a period. So your blast is basically your cycle of steroids, which takes maybe 12 to 16 weeks, depending on how uh, adventurous that person wants to be. <laughs> adventurous. And then, and then the, the blast followed into a cruise so the cruise was basically a period where you gave your body a break where you cruised along the issue there is that there's no underlying thought to i guess what dosages should be followed when you're on a cruise the whole point of a cruise in my opinion is that you return things back to a physiological <clears throat> level in order for um health markers to return back to baseline so when we use high levels of steroids it can cause issues surrounding our lipids so our cholesterol markers because of how they affect liver metabolism of fats and cholesterol but also it can cause issues then surrounding liver health as a whole because we all think that our liver is this indestructible organ that can regenerate itself that can only happen at physiological levels of testosterone. At super physiological or high levels of, of steroids in the body, the liver can't actually allow these stem cells to go into your liver to heal it. And that's where in the past we've seen liver cancers happen with bodybuilders because they never allow this um, repair mechanism to take place because of their steroid usage. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. So simply going from a 600 milligrams of testosterone or any anabolics in a blast, dropping down to 300, for instance, is not going to make much of a difference in terms of your recovery ability for your yeah. liver, organ and such. You exactly. need to go down to the actual TRT. Exactly, yeah. So, you, need to, you need to fall back into the physiological range in order for your body to actually return to homeostasis. And the reason being for this is that a testosterone level of, say, 16 made by your, your natural testicles versus a testosterone level of 16 from a testosterone injection, it's the exact same. The molecule is the exact same. I have one, one reason to believe this is not completely true about one thing, one thing only. I totally understand what you're saying, and I totally believe that in terms of building muscle, it's absolutely the same. What I have a little problem with this is compare a natural guy who wants to be shredded and he goes through the typical overtraining phases with cardio, low calories, low carbs, his testosterone level are going to go deep down. Yep. The guy who injects on the other way is going to have a constant stream of testosterone. So ideally, it shouldn't be easier for this guy to preserve the muscle mass, even though he's still within the physiological range compared to the other guy. Is it true, or am, am I missing something? No, it would be, yes, and he'd have, he'd have better recovery also. Um, so the guy, obviously what we're, we're trying to compare there is that what actually happens on a, a physiological level of someone who's at a natural HBTA versus someone who's controlling or manipulating their physiological level of testosterone or TRT. The whole point of why the person who's natural ends up in the, the gutter is also true to um, I guess nervous system stress as well as taking calories to a point down where there isn't enough available cholesterol as a backbone to produce testosterone also within the body. Gotcha. Um, 
and again that is a that's another whole discussion of the the stigma of guys who are hell bent on being hardcore natural bodybuilders for life who go through intense dieting phases to naturally get shredded who end up actually causing secondary hypogonadism where their testosterone level falls to a point where they're no longer capable of making natural levels of testosterone through their diet decisions. Being there in the past. Being there in the past. You know, it becomes then an ironic situation of you have someone who was hell bent on being all for no drug usage and, you know, very, you know, anti-drug stance to now actually having to depend on TRT because of what's happened to their body from pushing it to that extreme level of body fat basically um, but on a whole level in terms of someone doing a PCT to yes. restore their natural testosterone versus someone who, who's using TRT from a health perspective if that person is going to pursue steroids again in the short term it makes more sense to manipulate their hormone profile to a physiological level um, through TRT as opposed to going through a PCT, restarting the HBTA, causing certain health issues that may arise versus keeping a steady hormone level within the physiological range, although from an injection, allows their body to go back to the homeostasis and repair certain processes or go back to a baseline level of health before a decision is then made to increase the dosage again. Um, That's very interesting because it gives me something to think about the oral use of steroids. If what we have said regarding just dropping the dosage and still being super physiologic doesn't help in terms of recording, the old way of going, for instance, four or six weeks with oral anabolics and then four or six weeks off is gonna it's gonna negate the same effect basically isn't it it is yeah and that's again <clears throat> where we potentially see the likelihood of liver carcinoma happening is that an oral steroid typically tends to be added at the end of a blast phase in order to i guess add an ergogenic benefit to progress your strength Obviously, as you get to the end of an anabolic steroid cycle, things start to stall in some aspect, either recovery or strength. And the use of a oral anabolic steroid at that point allows you to break past that plateau to finish the cycle at a, a higher strength compared to your previous cycle. But in doing that, if the old philosophy of blast and cruising, you've ran your oral, now you're dropping to a level of testosterone that's still putting you in the super physiological range. You're never allowing these, what they're called, buccal stem cells from actually going into your liver to actually repair some of the damage. And slowly over time, the toxic effects of these oral steroids builds up a certain level of, I guess, fibrosis and cirrhosis in the liver that then does lead eventually to potential liver carcinoma. Fantastic. And I mean, I've, I've been told anecdotal reports of a guy in the UK, um, 28 years of age, who has went that route of oral use blast cruise, oral use blast cruise, whose liver actually burst. You mean literally? Literally burst. Wow. Um, he, he took a, a sudden impact to the side and his liver burst. And when they went to investigate, they actually found quite a, a lot of necrosis and fibrosis to his liver basically from uh, oral steroids can cause bile blockage which can then lead to issues with cholesterol that bile blockage again further damages liver cells by not allowing bile to flow out and take any toxic substances with it into the small intestine um but yeah this guy is a he had to have emergency surgery where his liver basically burst. You know what I love in all this? The, after all these negative things, it would be very easy just to dismiss the use of anabolics saying, just don't do it, guys. Don't do drugs. What I really like is your approach, which, is, which brings me to the third topic, which is your work with supplement needs. 
the supplements are fantastic quality is top notch they are delivering basically all around the world um how did it started and what's the aim of the um, of the brand so to speak so supplement needs i joined supplement needs as the formulator officially nearly three years ago 2018 was when i first approached lee and, and lee will tell you i was actually a customer of lee's i was buying you know whey protein and pre-workout from his just normal store before all this and then i seen he started to have a line of supplement needs health products so there was a multivitamin you know alpha gpc he had different ingredients that he was releasing under his own brand and one of the products that he had was a sleep aid which was basically 5 hdp and the renowned zma and i basically just told him the two of them combined are, are practically useless and uh, <laughs> a load of bs and I, I i put forward to him basically because of my own career job as a chemical engineer i work shift patterns so mm -hmm. i work one month of days one month of nights rough and, and as as t time went on obviously i started my my career job when i when i was 25 it within about two months of working nights i had to figure out some way to optimize my sleep and um, so for like say the first year of working shift i i wasn't fully clued into sleep mechanics or the biochemistry of sleep and it started to make me wonder how can i optimize my sleep properly what what are the like biochemical pathways that sleep relies on and um, start to think about more so from a a root cause functional medicine perspective that was around the time when i started to really start to think on a global level of bodybuilders health of how we can address the health issues that start from bodybuilding and supplement use from the root cause so how can we control cholesterol why why does cholesterol get disturbed when we use steroids why does sleep get disturbed why do we see certain issues with the liver and that's sort of my own research led me to you know develop all these different sort of stacks that i was using myself personally and that was sort of where the sleep stack came about that i was taking a sleep stack personally for about a year and it was amazing the difference in my sleep from combining the six ingredients within the sleep stack ha having done my research on the the biochemistry um I said to Lee, if you release this as a product and instead of that ZMA 5-HTP product, it'll be a sellout. I said to him, I've no doubt that this is going to change people's opinion towards sleep aids. In that <clears throat> there was very good sleep aids on the market as nutritional supplements that basically had high levels of melatonin and phenobut and GABA, which were basically just things that just took a, a sledgehammer to your head and knocked you out so you, you went to sleep but you didn't really get rest rested of sleep. the sleep stack aimed to put you asleep and then keep you asleep so that you went through your natural sleep cycle progressions while sleeping <clears throat> so from there he, he sort of he released the sleep stack and it was you know an instant sell -out. and so i said to him okay over the last you know two years from my own research i've sort of developed you know a heart stack a kidney stack liver stack i said to you, my vision if you're willing to to follow my direction is to have a supplement company that caters for all bodybuilders in one place so before i would have been buying you know individual ingredients from amazon from i have i heard different you know health monthly all these different companies that offer wholesale distribution of you know swanson's jarrow's all these well-known brands and i was just getting to the point where i was frustrating that you know you were opening up like 15 or 16 different bottles to take a capsule out of each one in order to, to take your daily supplements and i said to him if you had you know cv stack or heart stack that's you know a product that has 11 or 12 ingredients in it that you only have to take you know five or six capsules of it a day it's so much handier that someone can go to your site buy one bottle and know that their heart health is being catered for 
with that one supplement as opposed to having to buy 15 or 16 different bottles. The other thing then was I said to him that the compounds that we use, the ingredients have to be, you know, well clinically dosed. The quality has to be there and they have to be cost efficient. And Lee has been in the supplement industry for quite a long time. And he, he completely agreed with what I was saying that first off, customers come first. And then from there, you know, obviously profit margin and whatever comes afterwards. That there was no point in making this superior product and then not having it accessible to people in terms of cost. Which speaks volume of the quality of the person we are talking with now. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, you could easily charge double for what the products are. But in terms of taking people's health into consideration and the sort of niche that we're within, um, it goes to show again that it's not all about money. It, it's, you know, if we can make this big impact towards people's health within this industry, well, that's a big, huge return of, of the investment. And I mean, the, 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 I guess brand loyalty shines true that we see the products being shipped all over the world. Do they ship in Italy as well for the for the viewers? They yes, yes, yeah, yes, they do. Yeah, Perfect. and there's there's a couple of European distributors as well that if they inquire, Lee will be able to um, tell them about that. Might save them a little bit of cost on shipping. But um, I guess it was sort of like you'd go to Supplement Needs website and then you had every single supplement you could think of combined into these stacks as a bodybuilder and know, okay, this month I just need to go on to Supplement Needs, order, you know, heart stack, liver stack, uh, sleep stack, and then that's my health covered. I don't need to go to Amazon or iHerb and, you know, I'm not waiting on different delivery dates. It, it was really to make it a business that's all consolidated into one place. Fantastic. Out of, out of curiosity, sorry to interrupt, just a curiosity. Which is the your um, your best seller? Still the sleep stack? I think the sleep stack, yeah, the sleep stack. And then after that, any of the three that are within the advanced health stack, so the liver, kidney, um, heart, all three of those also sell out very quick. Um, Do you think the sleep stack uh, success is due to the excess use of trend by modern competitors? <laughs> So, so I think that's sort of where I flipped things on its head, where I actually started to go, you know what, you can actually reverse some of the sleep-induced damage from high androgens. And I guess when I started speaking about this, people were sort of very skeptical on what, what I was saying from a biochemical level, because no one else was, I guess, thinking logically over what's happening. And when I started to think over, you know, the biochemical aspects of why trend could cause your sleep to be poor, um, when I started to tell the solutions surrounding, you know, the sleep stack due to the, the 5-HTP replenishing serotonin, the magnesium helping to support dopamine clearance and your COMT enzyme. When I started to tell people about this and how you go about treating the transomnia is what I call it, people were shocked because within two weeks of following what I was saying, you know, years of potentially insomnia induced sleep deficits from Trembolone use with contest prep was instantly reversed. Um, and without having people to rely on the likes of very harsh, I guess, benzodiazepines or, um, again, sleep products like Phenobut to just get them to go asleep rather than lying in bed awake all night. Gotcha. Well, Dr. Dean, I think for our viewers in Italy, this is more than enough to start to appreciate your persona and your expertise. Thank you very much for uh, your time and your words. Um, where people can have more information about you? Where can they reach out to you? So my Instagram is D-E-A-N-S-T-M, D-E-N-S-T-M. And through there, you'll get access to my email. And I've also got the links to my YouTube page there. But Instagram is probably the, the handiest place to, to reach out to me and, and send me a DM if they have any questions. There's also a whole bunch of highlights with yes, anything very you helpful. think of that are there for people to take advantage of. 
um there's you know hours of highlights there to to scroll through surrounding sleep my opinions on you know aas use and even just random current political topics <laughs> which actually are the best part for me just now but that's a different story just i need to take my tin at off <laughs> There you go. How long that is gonna take before we will see the website, uh, Doctor Dean? So the website was was a, an idea for to have a education platform for supplement needs in order for me to educate on the products because <clears throat> on a legal level it's very difficult to speak about nutritional products surrounding trade standards on your own commercial website so lee can't have any <clears throat> education content on the website from myself explaining the products because of you need to be able to support certain supplements through approved claims which is ridiculous so the education website was an idea that i can then create content to speak through all the products so the heart stack liver sleep and explain to people how they work, you know, how the underlying biochemistry works, um, you know, little bits of tips on how to further improve maybe your sleep, improve your um, cardiovascular health, as well as creating like a forum platform where people can then interact with the different athletes within the company also, because we do have quite a lot of professionals that are sponsored by supplement needs that it would be great to give people access to them. So the, the education website is almost ready. We did have a couple of road bumps last month that has delayed it. We were hoping to have it launched by May. But uh, hopefully all things considered, the start of August should see the, the website itself launch with all the free content. And then at some point later in the year, there will be like a subscription service where there will be an online, you know, like I said, the forum, more in-depth discussions in terms of video content that would be more so for paid subscribers that i'll personally delve into you know certain aspects of you know supplement usage maintaining health i've got other guys that are top level coaches or nutritionists that are part of the team now also that will be providing video content on that aspect as well so well, you can my, count on me for being a subscriber over there, I can tell you that. So so my, my goal is to create like a, a really in-depth education website that promotes the brand ethos while giving customers the chance to educate themselves on how to further improve their health along with the supplement needs range. Correct me if I'm wrong, but basically what you're trying to do is make look like a trained by GP website a beginning uh in in summary and, and, yes <laughs> yes you you you, you want to then feel embarrassed for themselves looking so, at their website with your website that's so, uh, that's the I main guess, goal basically yeah i guess like that's that's sort of um for anyone in italy that's sort of my driving factor for this education website is to to i guess there are some good education websites out there but <clears throat> for what i've got planned with this it's it's going to be fairly epic that I'm I sure. don't think I don't think anyone else is going to provide the level of content that I've hopefully got planned for this this site. Gotcha. You know what? They were uh, so different. I wanted to ask you so many specific questions, but unfortunately, I was spoken to my wife, and she said, "Just stick to the basics. Don't bust this ball with too much technicality. <laughs> People need to know who he is." Ask him who he is, and that's it. And I said, you know what, you're right. Because she used to do this job for a living. That's why I rely on her expertise. But I, I do have one question, just if I can pick your brain, uh, regards uh, out of the record, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'm getting very, very interested in the pharmacology of, of, pharmacology of these uh, compounds. And is it true that trembolone is actually more tissue selective than testosterone? If you look at the muscle, muscle mass to prostate uh, activation, it is yeah. So f from a, a, I guess a simple level, you could technically classify 
trembolone as a selective androgen receptor modulator, which are basically a, a, a class of new compounds that basically act on the androgen receptor itself, as opposed to um, in, within muscle tissue, as opposed to the androgen receptor within androgenic tissues. So within the body, you have androgen receptors all over it. You have two modes of action the either have myotropism which is basically promote muscle growth mm -hmm. or you have or you have then the androgenic uh, the androgenic um, side effects which are basically um causing enhanced sexual function um i guess increased oil secretion from the skin and um, prostate enlargement would be one thing you know sexual sexual organ growth um so the whole point with the SARMs is that you have compounds that selectively act on androgen receptors within muscle tissue as opposed to androgen receptors within androgenic tissue. Gotcha. And with that, then you get a higher, more favorable anabolic ratio to androgenicity. And so, trembolone, trembolone is one of those compounds that we see has quite a high selectivity for androgen receptors within muscle tissue. But again, the, the mechanism surrounding that is sort of really poorly understood. So if I look at uh, the William Lieberlein book, um, this is not the case also, even though it's uh, much weaker for uh, oral turinable. I mean, the androgenicity is considered between zero and seven, or it's very, very poor. And the uh, anabolic effect is considered around 90, if you consider testosterone as 100. So yeah. in, isn't it uh, probably the, the best form of SARM we have? In some so, way. so you see, oral steroids don't actually act in the same manner as injectable steroids. They have a completely separate mechanism of action in terms of an injectable, the likes of the DHT and the testosterone-based compounds, move into the nucleus after they attach to the androgen receptor and cause gene transcription directly when the androgen receptor complex goes into the nucleus. With oral steroids, we don't see this androgen receptor binding affinity being as great as the uh, injectable compounds. So we start to think, is there a further gene transcription occurring um, outside of the nucleus being driven by these oral steroids. So it, it becomes a much more complex, I guess, mechanism of action versus the typical androgen binds to the androgen receptor, it goes to the nucleus where your, your genes and your DNA are and turns on specific genes. So for example, it turns on a specific gene that leads to um, muscle protein synthesis or increased nitrogen retention. The orals tend to act um, what we believe extra nuclearly, but still have an effect on gene transcription. Fascinating, so it's, fascinating. It's, uh, it's something that I covered in, in uh, my pharmacology of steroids talk when I gave it up body power last year. I, I saw the... The problem is the the audio is terrible in that video, and I could, yeah. I, I, I physically couldn't hear, so uh, okay, I need to give up that. So that so that um, else has been uh, greatly studied in your videos, but that was something I was missing, right? Yeah, so that that's where uh, that's that's where the use of orals sort of takes on its own sort of, I guess, world that we we can't directly correlate them the same way as. Um, as the, the injectable forms based on how they, they act at the receptor level. Gotcha.